Have you heard of a Dorvan lord named Aldor Greybeard? Perhaps his beard was grey once, but to all who remember him it was always black with soot, and so heavily singed that he drew a raucous grumbling every time he set foot in respectable holds. You might think this just the setting stone pretensions of the Dawi, however Aldor had a knack for making enemies of all breeds, as we shall soon see. He was an engineer by profession, and by some accounts a good one. He mastered all the ideas of the Dorvan Engineers Guild. Problem was that he added a few ideas of his own. Aldor was not so concerned with mastering well-worn designs, dreaming instead of that which was not yet to be built. Such things kept him on the naughty lists of the top engineers, but even they couldn't deny him graduation and tenure as a working member of the guild. As the years went on, whispers from the surface began to make their way down into the holds. Whispers of great change and great danger. These latched into Aldor like a fisherman's hook, drawing him up into the world year by year and issuing a dark call to adventure. You see, the world was approaching a fresh calamity. The fog of chaos, the dark magic of twisted gods, was descending. Such things were beyond the care of the Dawi, which is why Alder's keen ear for fresh tales was all important. He gained a measure of influence in the guild with his warnings of a coming war, and his recommendations that no corner be left unsearched when it came to weaponizing the guild's machines. The guild masters, however, could point at machines that had served the dwarf lords loyally for millennia. They came to detest Aldor's insubordinate drive to spend good coin on daft experiments, emptying a year's worth of black powder into a day's work, and demanding altered specifications every time he required a common part. It certainly wouldn't do, but the fuss of having him brought down a shaft or two was deterrent enough to keep him around. He really blew it though, when at a feast of the High Lords at Karazakarak he stood to speak. My reputation might precede me, but forgive a poor clanker for spoiling the brew for a round. We've heard quarrels from sky to abyss tonight, haven't we? Don't you think we've missed one, though? One that looms just as sure as the sky, and destroys it as sure as the abyss. Ah, uh, you already know it. I see it in the shake of your weaves. I'm going to say it. Prepare yourselves. Chaos. The end times. Aye, that's what those closer to the grindstone call it. The end times. <laughs> and you think to yourselves, who's got time for that? Well, just think about it. What if chaos was to infiltrate our holds? What if magic users came? What if the green skins were bolstered by the pawns of the filthy gods themselves? Wouldn't that be trouble for us? I say fine, drink tonight, but tomorrow. We ought to be preparing ourselves for something that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Our underways aren't deep enough, our steel isn't thick enough, our numbers nowhere close to what we had the last time such an age of high storms are broke upon the holds. Nay, there's only one advantage we now have. Wisdom. Machines that do the work of fifty and can settle the grudges of just as many. Let the mountains rumble not under the feet of endless hordes of foes, but by the industry of the Engineers Guild. We'll make it so we can all make it, if you get my meaning. And really, I'm not asking for much. For dark times like these, what's fifty years advance on the requisition if it saves us all, eh? Aldor Greybeard, Master Engineer by title but not at all by bearing. King Thorgrim Grudgebearer began from behind a good ten meters of granite table. You stir the holds to madness. Even if we were to take your word that the legions of chaos are just a turn of the page from falling on this very chamber, what foaming expense would you have us make to satisfy your paranoia? We have to dig deep and range far, Aldor said quietly. There was a clamor for him to repeat himself above which he called. We have to be prepared to make a great journey. I have a proposal, an emergency measure that will guarantee the continuation of all good Dawi lines, if the worst should happen. A citadel in distant lands, a seed which might regrow our cause anew. 
I'm asking you, lords, to do what the engineer's guild is too afraid to consider. To prepare for our future. To prepare for our deaths. As for the expense, well, might you consider it an investment? You'll stand to lose less for making it when the last long beard falls. At this, the clamor became an uproar, then a riot. Aldor may not seem too unreasonable to you, yet his words were laced with insults that only those who felt their course of action unalterable would feel. That eve began a disciplinary process that would see Aldor expelled from the Engineer's Guild. Mind you, the process was a few years in length. No need to be hasty, certainly not in matters of engineering. Yet, once set in motion, Aldor's fall from grace was as inevitable as the very rise of chaos he had spilt good ale over. This wasn't all for naught. Some listening in the hall that night felt wisdom in Aldor's words. Many in the guild could not help but be curious about what the mad manufacturer had in mind. A citadel in distant lands. There was a certain kind of dwarf to whom such ideas appealed. And most of them were right there in the engineer's guild. Somewhere near the bottom, of course. Foremost was Kazran Crumson, who gathered together a band of supporters and brought them to Aldor with a beaming curve in his beard. You've ruffled a few braids, haven't you? Good. Just what we all needed, he said. I wouldn't mind a bit of a trip. Ah, who am I kidding? I just want to have a peek at your blueprints. It's a ship, isn't it? You want to go overseas? Aye, Crumson. Far overseas. Lustria, or further. Somewhere we'll have time to dig deep and range far. Yes, I like your little catchphrase. I think we'll be able to rustle up a few recruits and get this going. I fear the elders won't allow it. You'd best leave me be, for your own sake. Allow it? I thought the whole notion here was doing what wasn't allowed. Might just save us all. Come on, first things first. Pick some sea, and we'll go start a camp. Easy as that. Driven on by a growing crowd of curious engineers, Aldor's proposals turned into a project, into a prospect. More specifically, into a large iron-plated ship at Barak Var, on the far edges of the eternal Dorvan Kingdom. It had room enough for thousands of passengers, albeit in beard's length of one another. In small groups, more and more Dawi trickled into this curious tub. The legend of Aldor's quest for adventure and salvation had got its hooks into a fair few from far and wide. First came the young, with no grudges worthy of ink to their names. Then the old, with no grudges left to settle. Aldor gave them all a sack of gunpowder to look after, something of a gift from his own perspective, and had them pile onto his boat. Dwarves and boats are things rarely mixed, but Aldor was indeed the master of rare mixes. It was his own formulation of burning liquid coal that fired up the colossal steam engines to push the cruiser off into the Black Gulf, down the long coastline of the Greenskin Badlands, and then out into the Great Ocean. It was beyond that ocean that Aldor fancied himself the overlord of a great vault to guard against the fall of the Karazankor. The ship, with the motto Dig Deep and Range Far emblazoned on its flanks, steamed towards the unknown. However, Range Far it did not. A week into the voyage, a wind kicked up without warning, rushing southwards and turning the ship off course with every wave. Aldor battled with the rudders to counteract this force of nature, but even after a full day, the gales showed no sign of abating. Kazran volunteered to go up in the gyrocopter to fly above the ship and see the lay of the far-off clouds. Before his survey was done, there was great trouble below. There was a crashing boom, and the ship was left resounding like a bell. A section of the lower deck had suffered damage, as if something had exploded and cracked the hull inwards. The great halls of tools and stock Aldo had brought with him was at risk of water and fire both. The engineers on the deck were rushing from side to side, trying to spy a threat in the waters. Those left below deck remembered well why travel by sea was best avoided. No more blows were struck, and no one spotted anything amiss below the waves. Yet when Kazran landed the gyrocopter, he came to Aldor with a grim bearing. 
there's no mistake. You were right. I saw a beast as large as a hold, only as a shadow, creeping astride us. It left us be, and patrols a ways ahead, he reported. I've never heard of a chaos beast taking up residence in the seas, Uldor replied. Aye, we've never heard of the greater body of what the Dark Gods produce. I say take no chances until we're well ready. That's our purpose after all, eh? Counsel me not. The water's taken us off as we grumble. Indeed, the listing of the boat as it took on water was turning it southwards, carried with the wind and waves. Within an hour, land was visible, at which the engines were set to reverse. Kazran gave everything he could to get the paddles to push back against the waves, only to come back again with that sour face. The ship ran aground. It was a mercifully smooth landing, being that this ground was more sand than rock. A scouting trip of no more than an hour revealed their new landing. It was a realm known as Araby, a realm quite forsaken by many, the dwarves perhaps most of all. At the same time, it was a realm going through great changes, and be assured that the marooning of a ship full of ambitious dwarves was only going to change things further. On the horizon, the spires of a castle could be seen in silhouette the following morning. Gyrocopter and telescope were enough to get the full picture. It was a fortress of Bretonia, sparkling and new, a colony. Perhaps a crew after Uldor's own heart dwelt there. He threw away such fantasies when a gaggle of their warriors came to harass the camp the Dawi were building around the stranded ship. For now, they were only shouting things, probably to the effect of go away. With all the gunpowder the dwarf had brought, it was tempting to give them a very loud reply. Uldor ordered against it, and by now the distressed crew were happy to consider Uldor their thane. Kazran took the gyrocopter beyond the horizon, mapping their surrounds. At last he returned from a mission with a smile behind his beard. His discoveries soon had the whole ship emptied of valuables, stacked up onto the grumbling crew to be lugged across the yellow desert. They were headed south, towards the welcome embrace of a tall mountain range. A few rocks that block the sky are all a dwarf needs to feel at home, and indeed the sight of the thin trail of the Atalan Mountains drove Uldor's column almost to a jog. The steadfast fortitude that had got them to brave the seas was now discarded gleefully. The closer the mountains got, the better. The Bretonians, riding exhausted horses, shadowed the dwarves the whole way, stopping only at the mouth of the first mountain valley. The Bretonians knew better than to go into those mountains and returned home. The Atalan Mountains formed a twin range, running parallel to each other, so that a thin exterior was cut off from the glowing desert on either side. In this valley had grown oases, sparse groves of desert trees, and banks of grasses that waved above the dwarves' heads, albeit not above the full height of the luggage they carried. A trickling stream guided them southwards through the valley. It was the remains of a torrent that had carved the towering canyon in ages past. Only a few thousand years ago, the river had been strong and rapid, running from highland springs mired in jungles to the far south. As such, vestiges of civilization were seen here and there. Humans had lived in the valley in large numbers once. A few still did, keeping their distance as the march of some 800 encumbered Dawi shuffled through. There was just one fellow who dared stand in the column's path. Of course, such courage meant that it had to be a Dawi too. The expedition halted in the face of a white-bearded dwarf in poorly kept silver armor. His axe, on the other hand, was pristine, held on his shoulder as he stood completely still, staring down the new arrivals. Well, are you going to bow? he said. His voice was unusual, accented away from the standard drone of the dwarf heartlands. Aye, I'll bow if we're to stand here all day. If only to set down this pack, Uldor said. Was that an attempt at humor? Oh, more than an attempt, friend. I must say, you have a rather odd way of speaking. You are odd to me. But in hearing it, I feel something very old light up in my mind. You are from very far away, aren't you? 
as if you could be from somewhere close. We come to shield the Karazhan Corps from the end times. We come to build a hidden fortress. Don't tell me you beat us to it. <laughs> the end times, is it? Well, you've come to the wrong place. Times ended here long ago. I am Thane Story Truai, Thane of all the proud Dawei you see at my back. Eh? Crompson, bring up the scope. I must be blind. Greybeard, I think he's, you know, attempting humor. No one's there, Kazran whispered. After some complaints, Aldor was able to extract a short history from this story Truai. A very long time ago, there were two deep Dorvan holds in the valley, one of which was just a day away. These holds were leftovers from a time when the Dwarves carved out the world with a mighty empire, laying their endless underway of tunnels, from which germinated huge city fortresses, the Karaks. Small communities of Dorvan exiles huddled on the surface levels of these collapsing warrens, trading with the human herders walking the valley. A few, a very scant few, claimed to be descendants of those ancients who had built the Karaks. Story Truai was the eldest of these bloodline barons. He called himself Thane, but admitted freely that little semblance of hierarchy remained. Every dwarf was on their own in the Atalan Mountains. Greybeard's company seemed poised to buck that trend. Thori led them towards Eye of the Panther, a human village that concealed the entrance to the lesser of the two lost Karaks. On the way, Kazran asked him, Don't know if I'm asking a foolish question, but we back in the Angkor haven't heard about any Dawi carrying on in these parts. We'd have let you come home if we'd known you were in dire straits. Underway's free to use, you know. Thori shook his head. We haven't travelled the underway for countless yonks. Do you even know what's out there, beneath the old deserts? There was a time some bright sparks went to go look for treasure in buried tombs. Not now. Go down the underway today, all you'll hear are the echoes of whatever darkness is creeping from those pyramids. Your Lord Engineer spoke of the end times. Here we have the opposite problem. It's all starting over, and it's been quite renewed by its slumber. Indeed, no more fitting a description exists for the bronze legions of the lost Tomb Kings. It might have sounded like Atalan was a strip of life in a desert of death. Not quite. More a desert of undeath. From that foreboding hint shall later grow just some of the many challenges that awaited Uldor and company there in that valley. As things stand at the current moment, though, it was a time of celebration to discover the lost Karaks. More perfect sites to begin the construction of hidden bastions they could not have wished for, or perhaps even built with their own hands at their intended destination. At Eye of the Panther, and the second, larger site called Vulture Mountain, the expedition set up shop and began refitting the Karaks for use. The dwarves already there were astounded to see the mighty machines of Uldor's engineers at work. Soon they fell in like everyone else, calling Uldor their lord. Uldor wasn't particularly one for lordship, wearing the title quietly and without pomp. All he cared about was booting up the Karak's deep mines and establishing workshops for the creation of the mechanical weapons he would use to protect his new charge and protection they would need aplenty. The chilling hisses in the underway, the rumbling hooves upon the unseen valleys of the high mountains, the echoing horns of greenskin scouts, the shimmering banners of Bretonian crusaders, and quietest but most daunting of all, the gathering storm of the new age of chaos. The world was going to be well tested and in dire need of weapons worthy of a war none living had yet seen. In other words, it was in dire need of Uldor Greybeard. <laughs>